think I'm ready to get started. My name again is Wesley. I don't know if you can see Butters. Butters sitting here with me. She probably won't stay for very long. Um, but we're going to talk today about Chronicles of Narnia and C.S. Lewis. Uh, we have done a short course on The Hobbit and The uh, uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, the Wrinkle in Time, or rather A Wrinkle in Time, and Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And these courses we're doing now are short introductions to each of the sequels of those books, or other books in the same series. Um, in the case of C.S. Lewis, uh, there's a bit of a controversy about what book is the proper sequel to uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but I'm going to follow the advice that I've been given by people who are a little more knowledgeable than me, um, and I'm going to consider Prince Caspian to be the one to read next. Um, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, of course, is the first that C.S. Lewis wrote, and Prince Caspian is the next one. Um, so that's one good argument for why um, we're doing it this way. Um, I think that the uh, subtitle here is also kind of a giveaway. Um, Prince Caspian, The Return to Narnia is the original title uh, that C.S. Lewis came up with. And um, I think that when you open up this book and start reading, you can see that it makes a really excellent sequel um, because it starts with exactly that, the return to Narnia. And um, that experience, I think, of getting pulled into a magical world is very much what we're going for here at Signum Academy. Um, so I'm really glad to get to read this book again and to uh, talk about it a little bit here with you guys. Again, just for an hour or so, um, probably even a little less than that, uh, I um, reread this book back in the fall, um, and that was when I think we were originally planning to start up Signum Academy on Twitch. Um, and so it's it's pretty fresh in my mind, but uh, I'm not as familiar with this series, Narnia, as I am with um, Tolkien's Hobbit and Lord of the Rings and his other writing. Um, I think I read the Narnia books once or twice as a kid. I know I read them at least once, probably read them a second time at some point. Um, and then I've just recently reread them again, like I said, back in the fall. Um, I haven't read them more than two or three times, whereas with Tolkien, it's got to be five, six, ten times now um, that I've gone back to those books. So um, if I make some kind of careless errors or forget some things, uh, that that's why. Um, I am by no means, I am not an expert on C.S. Lewis here. Uh, but like I said, I've had some good conversations with people who are. I've um, been really fortunate to uh, take a course with Brenton Dickinson, who uh, is the Pilgrim in Narnia, um, the writer of the blog, A Pilgrim in Narnia, where I found this image of the, um, the books in their original order. Um, and he uh, studies C.S. Lewis and knows a ton. Um, I got to take a class that he was teaching back in the fall on Signum University, which was really cool. Um, a class about C.S. Lewis's book, The Four Loves, and some of the mythologies and other books that Lewis is drawing on in the argument he makes there. Um, it's a book that a lot of my students at the school I used to teach at uh, would read. It wasn't on our curriculum, but they would read it for their um, senior thesis. They thought it made a nice way to bring together some of the other stuff that they had been studying. Um, and it is, it's a great book. I just read it for the first time uh, over the summer, in the fall. Um, so definitely one for you older readers out there. Um, for you younger readers, let's talk about Prince Caspian. Uh, this quote comes from early, early in the book. It's Edmund. It says, look sharp, all catch hands and keep together. This is magic. I can tell by the feeling." quick. I don't know if you guys remember these characters 
super well. Uh, we got a little picture of, uh, looks like Lucy here, uh, dancing with the dryads and nymphs. Um, Edmund, if you recall, is kind of a jerk to Lucy in the first book. In Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when Lucy first goes through, she is overwhelmed with how awesome Narnia is. She can't wait to tell her brothers and sisters, brothers and sister, uh, and they, they don't believe her, right? Um, that you can get to another world through the wardrobe. Um, but then Edmund finds his way in, and he knows that it's true. What she's saying is true. He's the second youngest, and he doesn't want to be made fun of for believing what she's saying and so he he lies and says that it's all made up um, he of course also has a run-in with the white witch um, and gets separated from the others for a while there uh, so I'm assuming as usual that we've all read Lion the Witch in the Wardrobe I hope I'm not spoiling anything there with that little intro summary to the beginning of that book um, but if you're reading Prince Caspian and you see it's the return to Narnia, uh, you might you might make sure that you've read at least one other Narnia book first. I don't know. I guess it's not really required, but it could be handy. Um, so when you think about the, uh, the other thing that it says here on the title, calling this a story for children, well, like I said, C.S. Lewis wrote things for scholars like his friend Tolkien. He's a great and important scholar of English and Romance languages, right? Tolkien, more of the Old Norse, Old English, those Germanic languages. Um, and Lewis, more the Old, uh, old French, Middle English kind of um, closer relationship languages, we'll say. He um, has some very important work on English poetry and on uh, Paradise Lost in particular. And that, I mean, as far as great English poetry goes, that's really up there. Um, again, for you high school age readers who may you know, not be so interested in Narnia anymore, I, I, I feel you. I mean, I, I've been there. Um, check out some of Lewis's writing about uh, poetry. Uh, it's amazing. And check out Paradise Lost by John Milton. Um, yeah, he has a really influential piece about that. Uh, but this is his work for children, right? Um, so he dedicates the books of Narnia to kids, and this one, he says, is for all kids. Um, and we'll talk at the end of the session today a little bit about C.S. Lewis's thoughts about writing for children. But I'm kind of curious if you guys have some opinions or um, ideas about why this would be directed towards kids in particular. Um, why is it that some stories are specifically or especially for kids, for children, uh, other stories not? I wonder what he intends by kind of drawing attention to that element here. Um, I think, you know, he's inviting us, inviting young readers uh, into this world. Um, like The Hobbit, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was unexpectedly sort of um, a hit, really popular. Um, Tolkien himself has famously been less enthusiastic about the Narnia books. Uh, to put it mildly, he, he didn't really like them very much. But a lot of readers did. Uh, a lot of young readers, um, a lot of older readers kind of picked up on some of what C.S. Lewis was doing with the Narnia books, and a lot of young readers just loved them. Like me, as a kid, loved these books. Really uh, one of my favorites. Um, when I was a little older and I looked at them again, I didn't enjoy them as much. I mean, I could still really see um, the the fun and adventure of these books, um, but the, the writing, the style of writing, was a little less interesting to me. Um, 
I thought of myself as being pretty sophisticated and you know good reader and these are really easy they're easy books um, for an older uh, kid for a younger kid they're just right I think um, for a beginning reader you know they they will certainly challenge some um, some new words some ideas might go over your head uh, so C.S. Lewis and his Narnia books are clearly directed towards children in a way that um, like we were talking about last time some of Tolkien's sequels to The Hobbit really uh, move in a different direction um, they, they become a much bigger a much more challenging kind of story I think um, and in less obvious ways I want to say that the Narnia books are too. Um, when I mentioned, you know, adults could see what C.S. Lewis was up to, um, I'm talking about some of the themes, some of the, the myth, like we talked about in our class with Professor Dickieson, um, and particularly the kind of religious uh, component to the Narnia story. Um, there is a strong undercurrent if you can call it that I mean it's it's pretty clear when you know what you're looking for um, that CS Lewis is writing a Christian story here a, a religious story that has you know a lot of his own beliefs connected to it um, a lot of his writing for adults is is um, apologetic or you know explaining his beliefs and arguing for why he believes what he does um, and the way that he does that in Narnia is through the story um, through some characters who are recognizable uh, references or you know stand-ins for some of the characters in the Christian story and that gets developed in some interesting ways uh, throughout this the series um, it's really clear like I said when you know what you're looking for but as a kid reading these books I didn't notice it to be honest I just thought they were fun stories um, if there's uh, a, a dent in my belief of myself being sophisticated well uh, sorry I guess I just I wasn't that um, that aware of what was going on at, at that time, and um, and that's okay, right? Uh, he's writing for people who do believe and who don't believe, and he's writing the same story for everyone, right? Um, each person, as Aslan points out, has their own story, um, but they are all kind of invited welcomed to join this world of Narnia um, so why call it a story for children I'm kind of interested what you guys think about that that's some of my take on it and how the children have changed this is my other kind of question when you open this book you know it's taking place shortly after the events of Lion the Witch in the Wardrobe in terms of the time uh, the age of the kids in our world the real world quote unquote and but when they go back into Narnia um, they see that Narnia has changed quite dramatically um, so that's my other question here I'll, um, I've been talking too much already uh, so let me let me pause there I'll, uh, I'll check back and see if you guys have some thoughts on these. Um, of course, the time flows differently in the two worlds. So what's a short time in our world turns out to be quite a while in Narnia. Many years have passed. Um, 
So in terms of uh, time periods, um, the movement back and forth between worlds and the flow of time, um, again, these are some of those ideas that I think go really pretty deep uh, when you start to think about them. And um, that whole theme of belief and trust, telling the truth and lying, um, and maybe that there's certain things that children can see better than adults can. Um, th these are all, I think, some of the really interesting things about Narnia now that I look back at them uh, for a third time, let's say. Um, so when you're reading Narnia for the first time and you're just reading for fun, you don't have to worry too much about, you know, what's going on here uh, with um, the time travel. Uh, it just works really nicely in the story because it gives us a, um, a new kind of um, scene, right? It's Narnia, and yet it's sort of this different place, right? It's new, it's fresh. Um, we're not fighting the White Witch this time. She's been defeated for the moment. Um, instead, we have this kind of um, rightful king question, right? The title, Prince Caspian, uh, that that focuses us focuses us on this new character who we're hoping can um, win his kingdom back, right? Um, now it's a little awkward because uh, there is a little bit of a question about whether he is a rightful king. Um, his people are from a different place. It sounds like the Telmarines, they're called. They've come in and conquered what was the kingdom of the four Pevensey children, right? Um, and Peter, the high king, when he comes back, um, very quickly sort of picks up that role of being the leader again, the high king. Um, each of them is a king and queen in Narnia, uh, these children. So we've got, um, you know, kind of like a, uh, you know, is this town big enough for the both of us kind of thing going on here in Narnia. Um, of course, in the background, right, there's Aslan, the lion, who is the the lord of Narnia in some way, and then his father, the emperor over the sea as well. Um, a lot of, off, awful lot of rulers here. Um, and uh, the person that Caspian is fighting against his uncle King Miraz, right, who's clearly not the rightful king. So um, that's him in this picture, um, which I really love how everyone's attention, right, is focused on this battle between the boy King Peter and the grown-up King Miraz. Um, he's got his black uh, eagle design on his shield. Um, he's got his kind of glare. Um, and, man, the animals are so concerned it looks like Peter's not using his shield right you know it's kind of dangling down by his side um, we can see the soldiers on the other side looking on cheering for their king um, and then off to the side right We've got the giant the centaur the bear um, again this this is part of what Tolkien was um, not as keen on when it came to Narnia, the way that C.S. Lewis is very happy to throw in the talking animals, the giants, the centaurs. He'll throw stuff in from all over the place, uh, willy-nilly, really. And um, we see that too with uh, the fawn, right, Mr. Tumnus in the first book. And in this one, we even meet Bacchus himself, right? Um, the god of wine and revelry uh, from Greek mythology. So we just kind of toss it all in there, not super c 
kind of worried about how it's all supposed to to fit but of course that is a question we might ask right um, how do we get Prince Caspian to fit in with all these other kings who are running around how do we get this um, world of humans and talking animals and giants to fit in with our real world right and again some of the beliefs that C.S. Lewis has about the real world um, that he's working on sharing through this story how do we get this book again to fit in with the other books that C.S. Lewis has written so there's all these ways that um, there's some there's some issues there maybe right about how, how these things uh, kind of play nice together or, or don't um, and that's that's why I put this other picture here um, this of course C.S. Lewis as a child um, he's got a toy of his own here um, and in many of C.S. Lewis's books he draws on his own experiences as a young child. Um, it's something from a very early age that he was interested in, this idea of um, talking animals, of course, fairy tales, and of course his religious beliefs, um, although he went away from them for a time, um, he eventually comes back to them in a big way. Um, and always, I guess, that sense that there was, you know, something more, something that he wanted to be able to, to talk to and, and know. Um, he talks about this in a lot of his books. And I think that the Narnia books are a way for him, again, to, to share that. Um, so giving other children a language, a world, um, a way to, I don't know, get in touch with some of those things that they might believe in and, and not really know why, or, you know, sort of f have this feeling, like Edmund does, this feeling of magic, um, but maybe they have never been able to, you know, understand it. Um, Whereas Edmund, because of what he's gone through, Edmund does seem to understand. So, um, the, uh, the question then becomes, I think, um, you know, where, where is Narnia? Uh, how does it fit in with um, the world that we live in every day? Um, in terms of the book, you know, this... Each one has its own map, and this is the map that goes with Prince Caspian. Um, we have the uh, slightly older way of saying the castle of Miraz, Miraz his castle, in Beaver's Dam. The Lantern Waste from back in the first book, where Lucy and Edmund first come through the wardrobe. Um, but most of these events actually take place centered around Aslan's Howl, the hill or the mound where the stone table from the first book is covered up, buried. Um, the Dancing Lawn, Biruna, where the battle takes place, and uh, over on the shore of the sea, Ker Paravel. I just always like that name, Ker Paravel. It has such a noble sound to it. Um, then down here, uh, the bulgy bear, the truffle hunter, right? So some other kind of silly or playful kind of names. Um, so again, we have this kind of neat mixture. Off to each side of the map, you know, there's other w lands that we're going to we're gonna explore in other books, right? Um, we'll go down into Archon Land and the horse and his boy. We'll go up to the north where the giants live um, in the silver chair, right? And of course, we'll sail, just getting my directions right, <laughs> east. We'll sail east over the, uh, the ocean 
um, it's confusing because in most of the old stories, it's it's west. You know, you sail west over the ocean. In Tolkien, Tolkien understood it's west. Um, but for for Lewis and Narnia, they sail east over the ocean uh, in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which is probably my favorite Narnia book, I think. Um, and then uh, uh, we'll visit other worlds entirely in uh, The Magician's Nephew. Um, uh, Gosh, I'm probably forgetting one. Uh, the, the Last Battle. Let me go back and make sure I, I mentioned them all. Yeah. Horse and His Boy, Don Treader. Yeah, got him. Okay. Um, but this map of Narnia, um, it is nowhere near as detailed, right, as Tolkien's maps. Um, and that's just, again, kind of indicative of the two different approaches that they had and the two different you know, ways of, uh, of writing that they had. Tolkien famously worked endlessly over his writing, um, kept changing things in his story, would never finish things, right? And C.S. Lewis famously would write just, it would flow, you know, it seemed like he uh, was just never had to go back and change anything. I mean, Again, I don't know enough about uh, Lewis's writing style, um, but I think you can see that a little bit. That that's the sense of just talking, right? He's just a brilliant talker, um, and it sort of flows out of him. Um, and he finished his stories quickly. Uh, he he would uh, write three stories in the time it took. Uh, J.R. Tolkien, his friend, to, to write one or part of one or write one and start over and write a different one. So so they famously um, had this, this challenge where they were going to write a space travel story and a time travel story. And C.S. Lewis wrote his space travel story and then he wrote another one and then he wrote another one. <laughs> so he has this the so-called space trilogy or the ransom cycle. Uh, if you prefer, based on the, uh, the name of the character. Um, and I read those for the first time, and they're, they're really cool. They're really interesting. Um, kind of science fiction, fantasy. Uh, again, bringing in a lot of interesting religious ideas, playing with mythology, and, and they're cool. Um, meanwhile, J.R.R. Tolkien is supposed to be writing his time travel stories, and uh, he sort of writes one, and it's... Um, never never really finished um, and that that's one of Tolkien's books that I haven't read um, there's versions of it that exist that you can you can find um, there's one called the Notion Club Papers and uh, gosh the name of the other one is escaping me um, but he ends up sort of like bringing in Numenor and uh, this idea of, uh, of like reincarnation or, or sort of souls going through different generations. So uh, pretty pretty interesting stuff, it sounds like. But like, like I said, that's one I haven't read. Um, again, C.S. Lewis even brings in some of the time travel stuff into his book. Um, so he's, uh, he's really just taking from all over the place. Um, in terms of the, uh, the change to Narnia, and the changes to the characters. Let me let me check real quick here if we've got some some thoughts about that, or if anyone's corrected me on the uh, Tolkien book. No, not so far. Okay. If if you if you can catch something that I'm messing up, please please correct me. Um, but um, yeah. So what's changed in Narnia? Well, for one thing, when they first arrive. Um, they come a different way, right? They, they get pulled in from the train platform where they're waiting. Um, and uh, it's not a magic wardrobe this time, it's a magic uh, horn that Prince Caspian, he blew on the horn and summoned them um, back to Narnia. So that's one thing. Um, where they arrive is near their castle, Ker Paravel, and they can't recognize it at first. It's so different. Um, it's now an island, so the river, what's the word for that, you know, the river changed its course, 
cut off part of the land. Um, it islanded Care Paravel. It made it an island. Um, and it's also overgrown, right, with all ivy and the trees that they had planted have um, spread right up to the walls. And uh, the secret door down to the treasures has been covered up so the treasures are still there um, and they can use them. Um, this, I think this line comes from Peter. He's asking the others, have none of you guessed where we are? Um, they figure it out. And it's interesting the way they do. It's, it's partly because they're observant and they're noticing, uh, hey, this is a lot like our old castle. It's also, it seems like part of it is the memories are sort of coming back to them. They, they're sort of becoming the people that they were in Narnia, these kings and queens. They, they grew up while they were in Narnia in a certain way. Um, it turns out when they come back to the real world that they're still kids. Um, but in their imagination, let's say, in, in the story, they became these great kings and queens. Um, and they still are. They really, that's sort of who they truly are. Um, when they come to Narnia, that's that that self coming out, right? So that's, I think, part of what it means to go to Narnia, right? Is to, to become the person you, you truly are. Um, not to be shy or ashamed, right? But to be proud. Um, they have these incredible gifts, these talents. Um, you know, skills that they have, and also these treasures that they uh, can use in Narnia. Each of them has a special kind of uh, ability. So again, I'm always thinking of these books like if they were video games, you know, you'd, you'd have your, your party, your, your role-playing party. Um, each one has their kind of role that they fulfill in the group, um, and together they make this Kind of unstoppable team that's going to save the world, of course, um, like every <laughs> every RPG, every role playing game, um, and not just any role, right? But they again are the the kings and queens of Narnia. They, with Aslan's support, were there for the golden age of of Narnia after defeating the witch when all the different magical creatures, the talking animals, uh, lived in harmony. Um, and so to rule in Narnia, to really be the ruler, it seems like um, King Miraz has got totally the wrong idea, right, to um, sort of kick out all the talking animals to pretend they don't exist, right? To, um, you know, imprison the nurse, the poor nurse, and banish her just for telling stories about them to the prince. Um, clearly, he's got the wrong idea. To, to truly rule is to uh, understand and um, to, to bring together uh, all of these different people. Um, now, in the case of Aslan, it means maybe even a little more than that, right? If you go back and you read The Magician's Nephew, uh, maybe you read that one first because it's um, kind of marketed that way now, right, as uh, book one. The Magician's Nephew explains a little bit of how Narnia was created. And you see that it's Aslan's song that brings Narnia into being. Um, so great minds think alike on that one, right? Um, J.R.R. Tolkien in the Silmarillion has a song to be the creation of the world also. Um, and so speaking of Aslan, this other quote here comes from Lucy, right? She's always the one who gets Aslan the best, right? She really, she sees him first. She sees him clearest. And here she's talking to him. Um, she says, Aslan, you're bigger. That is because you are older, little one, answered he. Not because you are. I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. 
So, again, um, there's kind of this interesting way that the children grow up in Narnia, go back, and they're the same age they were. And those memories go kind of into, into hibernation, right? They come back, and those memories come back. Um, but they are also a little bit older. Um, and that seems important. Um, as you get older, you see things in a different way, right? And maybe even with the children themselves, we can see a difference between the youngest, Lucy, and the oldest, Peter and Susan. Susan especially seems to have a harder time getting Narnia. And this is one of those big controversies that Lewis is so good at stirring up. Um, in The Last Battle, the whole problem of Susan, right? This, this issue about what happens to Susan at the end of that book, people love to discuss. And uh, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I'm not going to go there right now, <laughs> but uh, if you've read all the books, then I think maybe you know what I mean. Um, no matter what order you read them in, I think the last battle is pretty clearly supposed to be the last one. <laughs> so, um, so maybe we'll, we'll get to that at some point here. But, um, you know, even in Prince Caspian, we have this, this little seed that's planted about um, what it means to grow up, um, what it means to take responsibility and to be uh, a leader in, in whatever form that might take for, for different people, right? Um, it's kind of sad. At the end of the book, Peter and Susan learn that they're not coming back to Narnia. Um, Aslan takes them aside and talks to them, and, and the reader, we don't see that conversation. So we're, again, sort of placed in this viewpoint, almost, of the younger kids, Lucy and Edmund, to an extent. Um, uh, yeah, uh, 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 let me let me not go there. <laughs> but but anyway, um, as you get older, Aslan gets bigger. That's kind of cool. That's a cool um, way of talking about this sense of the reality of what Narnia might really be, right? Um, and what it might really mean to go there to rule there, to sing and create there. Um, so I don't know about you, but when, when you get older and you go back to these books, I think you do find that they get, they grow, they get bigger too. Um, and that again has a lot to do with the reader. Um, so the last topic I was going to talk about here. Um, so next time we'll, we'll look more at Narnia, the series, how the books can be read and what different orders you can go, um, some ways to kind of play with those ideas. If there's time, maybe we'll even talk a little bit about the, uh, the last battle and some of what's going on there and some other controversies that people love to discuss with C.S. Lewis, you know, besides the the order to read the books, you know, there's there's lots of stuff in the books that people get pretty worked up about too. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, for today, the last topic I wanted to go to was this um, essay, I guess you call it. Uh, yeah, it's an article or essay. You can find it real easily online, um, and it's in other books too. Of three or on three ways of writing for children is the title, and uh, it's a great piece. Um, if you're interested in writing and stories, again, um, just reading the stories that Tolkien and Lewis and the others, the, reading the stories is is amazing. Uh, it's an awesome and a, a really unforgettable experience, and it will definitely teach you a lot about writing if you study their books closely. Uh, but reading what they say about stories is also a great idea. If you really like this stuff, if you have got the attention span, you're sticking with me till this point in the uh, discussion here, um, then this is probably a book for you. Um, 
or an essay rather for you. Three Ways for Writing for Children is um, he, he references uh, Tolkien's On Fairy Stories essay, which is awesome. Um, so read that one too. This one is maybe a little easier to get into, and that's kind of the one of the topics we've seen here with Lewis. A little easier to, to start, um, but definitely has a lot in it. And so he talks about some bad ways and some good ways uh, of writing for children. The bad way, um, he says, some, um, some admirers have kind of unintentionally taught him this bad way uh, because they talk about writing for children as if it's not interesting for them as, as adults, right? But it's stuff that kids would like, you know. So there's this um, kind of this sharp distinction between stuff for kids and stuff for adults. And I don't know if it's like that's never a good idea. Right? Um, I don't know if it's good for kids to read some of the stuff even C.S. Lewis wrote for adults. Um, that's I think up to you and your folks. But it's certainly the case that if you set out to write something for kids and you're not interested in it yourself, it's probably not going to be very interesting for kids either, right? It's going to be talking down to them and not taking them seriously and not, you know, not remembering that you were a kid too, right? And uh, everything seemed pretty important at the time and maybe not even remembering some things that um, the Bible for example, would say about how important kids are in the way of seeing the world that kids have, right? So I think that's definitely worth bearing in mind. Um, and so this, the good ways then are the opposite, right? They're when the writer or the storyteller is bearing some of that childlike wonder and that childlike, you know, um, Tenacity, you know, they, they get they dig into things and they don't let go, um, and they love stories, just like adults, just like any person loves stories, and so he points out that one way to do this is to tell a story to a particular child, right? Maybe um, in these cases, a child that is a relative or. Um, somebody that they're taking care of for whatever reason, right? They're spending time with, and they're telling the story to that child to, you know, create this world for them and create it kind of in between the two. Um, when that happens, C.S. Lewis says the stories can be amazing. And these are great examples. I mean, Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland, incredible, um, funny. Kenneth Graham, that's the wind in the willows. Never read *The Wind in the Willows*. I gosh, you you have a great treat in store. Um, that's one I would love to discuss sometime, actually. Um, and of course, his friend J.R.R. Tolkien in *The Hobbit*, and some of his other stories come out of him talking to his kids, you know, telling them bedtime stories or whatever. That is a great way, but it's not C.S. Lewis's way. Um, he didn't have kids. And uh, although he had, he uh, dedicates the Narnia books to some kids, um, they're, they're not his, right? And, and they didn't really come out of him telling the story to that kid, it sounds like. The third way, the third way, and that's the only way he could write, it sounds like, is writing because that is the way for him to, to say what he wants to say. Um, that's the art form as he puts it, um, and he compares it to music, right? There's a certain kind of um, genre that's right for communicating a certain musical idea, all right? So um, in this case, the kind of idea that he wants to tell, this thing about the way kids see the world and how they really get to the truth that maybe older people have missed or forgotten, or are trying to ignore right? um, the way that Lucy can see Aslan and the way that the kids can go to Narnia. Um, that's the kind of thing that this story um, 
is the best thing for him to communicate. Um, Lewis is great at writing arguments and about um, religion and poetry and all sorts of things. Um, he can do that too, but for this particular idea or this particular feeling that Lewis remembers and wants to share, the Narnia books are the way for him to do it. Um, and they are really, really unique. I mean, there, there's tons of imitators, let's say, or, um, or just people who were influenced by C.S. Lewis, by Tolkien. But when you go back and you read these books, I think you see that there's nothing quite like them. Um, and that they are saying things in a particular way that you can't really say without that story. Um, so I've, you know, tried to uh, just briefly kind of uh, bring you guys back or introduce you for the first time to the Narnia books, to um, Prince Caspian in particular. And um, I really hope that you're reading it along uh, uh, with us here, um, that you and your parents or somebody else, um, a friend, whoever it might be, are reading these books and talking about them wherever you are, too. Because um, that is really the best way um, to, to tell a story, right? With somebody else. Um, to enjoy a story and um, pick up on all, all the good stuff and the treasures that, that are there. Um, again, as always, you can send us comments and questions here at Signum Academy. Check out our website. And um, stay tuned every other Monday on Twitch. Uh, we'll be here. And uh, next time we'll go back to um, the great Narnia reading order controversy and some other issues uh, that people have with, with the Narnia books and see if we can dig into that a little bit. Uh, again, suggestions for other books to read. Very glad to hear them. Um, and these are my suggestions for you. Yeah, Check out Alice in Wonderland, Wind in the Willows, of course, Tolkien, and Three Ways for Writing of Writing for Children, um, and some of the other essays of C.S. Lewis. A good introduction to those. Again, A Pilgrim in Narnia, uh, if you look up that uh, blog. If you do it soon, I think he's doing like a giveaway um, celebrating uh, his thousandth post on the blog. Um, that's uh, Brenton Dickinson. Again, um, check out the blog soon then and uh, you could win a book or, or, or something. Um, good luck everybody and uh, and as always, um, happy reading. We'll see you next time.